So far on this channel, we've looked at the Beatles' music on every physical format from the past 60 years. Vinyl, cassette, CD, reel-to-reel, 8-track, and even 78s. But what about this? Issued in December 2009, this limited edition USB contained everything that was included in the CD box set, right down to the mini documentaries. But more importantly for audio files, it also included high-resolution FLAC files, making it the highest resolution presentation of the Beatles stereo albums ever to be officially released. I'm Andrew from Parlogram Auctions, and in this video, I'll take a close look at everything on this thing to find out if it really is the best sounding Beatles release ever. It's easy to forget, but at the time of this USB's release, the Beatles music was not available on iTunes or officially anywhere online. That didn't happen until November 2010, nearly a year after this appeared. For most people, these remastered CDs were good enough and provided a well overdue upgrade of the 1980s releases. By releasing this USB collection, Apple decided to give fans who were not interested in the mono collection something special with the stereo recordings. Issued as a limited edition of 30,000 pieces, this small metal Apple containing an EMI branded USB stick contained everything which was in the CD box set. It even included the 13 mini documentaries. These had appeared on a separate 51 minute DVD in the CD set and on each CD individually as a QuickTime movie file. All of the albums were presented in both MP3 and FLAC formats. FLAC stands for Free Lossless Audio Codec. It's a music file extension that offers bit perfect CD quality, but at half the size of a professional standard WAV file making it the perfect middle ground for audio files. Another appeal of FLAC is that unlike MP3, it doesn't shave off parts of the music to reduce the file size. This results in no loss of sound quality during compression. And that's something we'll return to later on in this video. Although never as popular a format as CD or DVD were in their heydays, FLAC is the format of choice for people who wanted the best sound quality in the digital domain and at an original retail price of $279, or around £200, it was well within the budget of most audiophile Beatle fans. It's also quite a cool desk ornament, and it's surprisingly dense, weighing in at 150 grams, or just over 5 ounces. It has the Beatles de-embossed on one side, and a small dimple on the base so it would sit still on your desk or shelf. The USB stick itself sat magnetically attached in the center and was removed by carefully pulling the stalk. A sharp tug in the wrong direction would easily snap it off, as many did. It actually only fits correctly one way, with the stalk leaning to the left. It sat comfortably inside the box in a preformed foam inlay, covered by a specially printed sheet of plastic, which is in turn covered by a clear lid. A small booklet is also included and gives just basic information about its contents and how to play it on both PC and Mac. The box itself is a nice looking piece too, similar in style and finish to the CD box set, but with a stickered information panel on the bottom. So that's what it looks like on the outside. The next thing to do is to stick it in the computer and see what's on the inside. For me, that was easier said than done. For although I was able to access the files containing all the music, I wasn't able to open the Mac Start menu on my 2015 MacBook Air, or a new 2021 iMac. Thankfully though, I still have my ancient late 2009 MacBook, running Apple's El Capitan software, which crucially has a flash player installed, and therefore I could open the Mac Start option on the USB's menu. So here we are on my trusty old MacBook, which is actually contemporary with the USB. And let's take a look what's on offer. Clicking on the Mac Start icon opens up the USB's main menu. Which displays its options circling around the Apple. Let's click first on Artwork. And that brings up a sub-menu where you're presented with all of the albums in chronological order, which animate when you hover over them. 
Let's stay with Please Please Me and click on these green buttons. The middle button enlarges the image, which is in fact the front of the digital booklet. You can use the forward and back buttons to leaf through it page by page. If you flip through it on the submenu page, it has a page turn animation. The contents of these digital booklets, by the way, is exactly the same as the CD booklets. OK, now let's go back to the menu. And next, click on Video. This launches a screen listing all of the mini documentaries and immediately starts playing the one from Please Please Me. My old computer was by this point struggling to keep up. As you can see, they're quite small. And if you click on the option to view them full screen, it makes them larger. But the video becomes very pixelated, indicating that it's quite a low resolution file. As I mentioned before, all of these documentaries were included on a separate DVD disc with a CD box set, where they were in much better quality. Going back to the main menu, let's now click through to the music option. Wow, this moving menu text is driving me crazy. So here we're presented with all the albums and we're invited to choose an album from below. So let's choose Beatles for Sale. It immediately launches into no reply, with the elapsed and remaining time on the track displayed to the right. You've also got options to skip tracks forward and backwards. If you click the Add Album to Library button, a dialog box appears telling you how to import the MP3 files into iTunes and how to play the FLAC files. To change albums, you just press pause and select another. If you click back directly to the menu, the track you are playing continues, so you have to go back and stop it before going into another album. The two double albums, the White Album and Past Masters, show two disc options, curiously spelt D-I-S-K. I bought this USB from Germany, so I'd like to know if disc is spelt that way on one from a different part of the world. If you have one, please let me know in the comments. Compared with the on-screen interfaces of today, it looks a bit dated, but everything worked okay. One thing that really surprised me about this set was the absence of copy protection. Anyone can simply copy the files onto the computer and then transfer them onto another USB, or indeed any other device, which I'm sure a lot of people did. Now let's cut to the chase and find out if the FLAC files sound better than the CDs. Just before I launch into the comparisons, let's have a look at exactly how the stereo remasters were prepared in the first place in three easy steps. Step one, the original analog tapes were transferred into top quality 24192 files. The 24 is the uncompressed bit depth and the 192 is the sample rate in kilohertz. Step two, the files were then downsampled to 2444.1 on which all of the editing, EQ fixes, etc. were done for the CD masters. Step 3. From that, they created a 16-bit 44.1 master from which the CDs were actually produced. The FLAC files on this USB were made at Step 2, i.e. using the same master source as the CDs just before they were downsampled to 16-bit for the production masters. So is there an audible difference between the CDs and the FLAC files? I've been through a lot of tracks on both the USB and the CD set on Adobe's Audition software. But to make things easier, I'm going to present just one to you here, which is the opening track to Beatles for Sale, no reply. I love this song, and it was well recorded too. In fact, I think Beatles for Sale is the best sounding of all their early stereo albums. Here's the waveform of no reply from the CD, with the left channel on the top and the right channel below. And it all looks very good. Lots of dynamic peaks with no brick walling or any other such horrors. As I switch to the FLAC file, there is, if you look carefully, a slight increase in the width of the waveform indicating a volume increase. It's a bit clearer if I put them side by side. Here you can see that the FLAC waveform below is clearly bigger or wider, and in fact exceeds the width of the left channel. 
And it's that feature which is the crucial difference between the FLAC files on this USB and the CD. The FLAC files are 0.2 decibels louder than those on the CD. And it's this volume difference which, when listening to them side by side, can fool your ears into thinking that the FLAC files sound better. It's not a huge difference in volume, and certainly one which wouldn't be detectable even if I was allowed to play them to you on YouTube. So in order to be sure, I reduced the amplitude of the FLAC files by 0.2 decibels, so they were both matched for volume. The resulting difference between them was, wait for it, nothing, nada, zero. In my opinion, there are no audible differences at normal listening levels between the CD and the FLAC files. If you want to get really technical about it, the only difference between the FLACs and the CDs is the lack of dither noise on the FLAC files. Dithering is a kind of white noise, which is added to a signal to try and mask or prevent truncated audio during fades. And the CDs had more of it than the FLAC files. The mastering engineers could and maybe should have done better with the FLAX, for despite having a theoretical dynamic range of 144 decibels, they still chose to add extra compression. If you want to hear the Beatles music on CD without compression, you can find it on the mono box set. The only problem with the mono box set is that it's in mono. Now, I haven't got a massively expensive high-end system with the best CD player or a digital to analog converter. But if you have and have done such a comparison test, do let me know your impressions in the comments. But what about the MP3 files? Well, they are what they are. Okay for the car, I guess. You can see by looking at them on the spectrograph that unlike the CD and FLAC files, there's a clear roll-off shelf at 17K. Now you might look at that and say, there's no way I want to listen to anything with that kind of roll-off. But the truth is that unless you're in your early 20s, you're not going to hear it, even if it was there. You might be able to hear information at 15K if you're under 40, but if you're over 50, forget it. We'll be lucky to hear anything over 12K. So unless you have an expensive high-end system with a top-of-the-range digital-to-analog converter, I don't think there's much point in getting this from a listening experience point of view. However, if you like cool looking collectibles and want a convenient way to listen to the Beatles in your car, it's a real winner. So what's next? These remasters will be 12 years old this year. And apart from the 2014 pressings of the Red and the Blue albums, there's still no true analog stereo pressings of the albums on the market. The remixes are fun, but they're not to everyone's taste. What we really need is an analog stereo set like the mono set, but just not as limited. Apple complained that it lost money on the mono set and are against producing ultra limited high end editions for the fear of making the Beatles product appear elitist or something just for the high end consumer. But if they put together a quality true analog stereo set, I'm sure they would have a lot of takers from all sides of the fan base. Let me know what you think. I hope you enjoyed this video. Do please like and comment if you did. And also let me know what other topics you'd like to see me cover in future videos. But that wraps it up for this one. So I'll say bye for now and thanks for watching.